Hi, it's Maria. And um, this is another one in Maria Unfiltered. So you're going to hear stuff that uh, <laughs> you might not have heard before. But anyway, um, today I wanted to talk about soul purpose. And um, sometimes, you know, we realize that our soul purpose uh, is actually so different than what we thought it would be. And it's so shocking. I just want to make sure that the volume is up. Okay. Well, we'll see. Okay. So anyway, um, I talked about it. Um, you know, it's kind of like the agenda of our soul, the purpose of our soul. Like, why are we here? Um, and it might be different than why we think we are here. You know, some people, um, you know, think that they're um, destined for greatness, you know. But uh, other people think, oh, well, that's not me, of course, because I just um, awaken every day and get my kids to school and um, go to a job that I now do from home. And then I run to the store and I cook and I clean and I do laundry, you know, and I look at YouTube a little bit before bed and do emails. And, and so people think that that's their life, you know, and then they climb under the covers and they're just uh, so glad to be there and they can kind of pretend that they're somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then they do it all over again tomorrow. So, um, you know, in previous videos, in those playground of your soul that I have uh, put on my um, website, MariaHaiti.com. Well, anyway, I talked about um, Henry David Thoreau, who happens to be one of my faves. He's um, He wrote Walden Pond. And so he so succinctly captured the human condition in his quote that um, you've probably heard of it. It's wonderful. It's um, men lead lives of quiet desperation. And it's true because um, he was just bang on with that one. Uh, so many people are are just, they don't know their sole purpose and yet they, they want to be uh, contributing, you know, to society and to humanity in general, but they just don't know what it is that makes them so special. But what's interesting is that of course they're special because everyone on this planet has a certain gift that they are to give the world. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't be on this planet and they wouldn't have taken up uh, space here, right? Another soul would have incarnated to take their place. So um, so we're more than just uh, hamsters on a wheel, even though we might think we are. Oh, the heater just turned on. <laughs> uh, I hope you can still hear me. Anyway, sometimes, you know, our sole purpose is different from how we uh, would think that that's the gift that we have for the world. And so um, I just thought I would mention that um, sometimes, sometimes we are pushed, you know, to face obstacles that uh, might have us grow in ways that we would have never imagined. And so um, sometimes situations are destined to happen and, uh, and it's for our soul expansion so that um, we become more of who we really are. Um, and those situations are needed so that we can awaken and we can grow as, as spirits, as souls, as, uh, as beings, as light beings. Anyway, you know, here's an example. For instance, if there's an Olympic skier, you know, um, you know and what if she's skiing down uh, a mountain and, um, and she loses control and hits a tree? And uh, perhaps, her and she becomes injured and she has a spinal cord injury. So perhaps her her um, sole purpose was not necessarily to be a, an Olympic skier, but rather um, that accident um, allowed her to kind of take a different path. And so she's now, uh, let's say, going to different schools and talking to children about, you know, the safety of, of that one needs, the exercising of of care and safety when one is, is doing any type of a sport. Or maybe she's um, talking to people with spinal cord injuries and uh, giving them a boost and a lift of how, you know, that's that sometimes is really the beginning of life for some people. You know, their tragedy, whatever that might be, can be used for good. And so, um, you know, we all have opportunities 
uh, and sometimes we view them as adversity. And so it's not really what it is actually. Um, I think it's really how we handle ourselves in all of the situations that we face. Um, you know, for me, <laughs> I, I never thought that my sole purpose, and you know, we can always uh, think we have it right, but, but sometimes it's just so obvious that it just smacks us in the face and we're like, oh, okay, I get it. Um, I never thought my purpose was to become a quintessential defendant, um, you know, and to show how broken our legal system really is. Um, I was the person, the quintessential defendant is the person who sued over and over and over again. And I was sued by the same person, an ex-husband, but anyway, that doesn't really matter. But it became so ridiculous that I would have had to have been totally unconscious, you know, not to realize that my soul was screaming for me to do something about it, not just to um, to slough it off and say, oh, well, he's wounded, he doesn't know any better, but oh my gosh, I, you know. And I went to law school and I had three children while I was there um, and I quit actually um, when my third son was born because I, I just thought, no, I my joy was in being with my family. And, um, and also, <laughs> Here's something. I realized I'm a horrible liar. And uh, oh my gosh, I, I am just the worst. And so um, I couldn't defend people who were hurting others. And so, you know, if you're killing people and you're robbing them and you're raping them and you're scamming them and you're perjuring yourself and you're forging signatures, you know, I'd be rolling my eyes to the jury and I'd say, oh my God. <laughs> You do not want me defending you because I wouldn't do it. And so, um, and I wouldn't give them an alibi. I wouldn't use your alibi saying you were in church that day. I mean, I just couldn't do it. Law was not for me. It was great training. You know, it was a wonderful education. And I learned so very much. But I also learned what I didn't want. And so sometimes that's, that's uh, what we learn when we engage in any particular endeavor. Um, but because our personalities don't change. And so um, even in my marriage, I couldn't sign a tax return that I knew <laughs> wasn't exactly right. You know, my, uh, whoever was preparing our taxes and my ex-husband would say, here, sign this. And I'm like, well, no, I wanna, I wanna understand it. And he's like, no, you can't just hurry up and sign it. Uh, you'd have the, uh, what is it? The ignorant uh, spouse uh, <laughs> excuse. But um, anyway, um, you know, yeah, we have to be true to our soul. And no matter what, we just can't be pressured into things that don't feel right. Um, but anyway, um, and, and so in part of the quintessential divorce thing was that uh, finally I said, after 16 years, I said, you know, I have to get a divorce. We, we didn't really ever get along. And, uh, and so it was, it, it should have happened like at the day after wedding but in any event I think I've talked about that in some other videos but um, uh, so when I said look you can take all the money you can you know just take everything I just want the children and so that's when he said well well if that's what you want that's what I'm gonna go and get <laughs> and I thought oh Maria you should have just kept quiet but anyway um, so you know in divorce what I saw was that you know there it's boundless greed and um it's all about trying to to defame the other person you know and to prove them that they're a nut and a slut or to prove them that they're a cheater or, or a child abuser or whatever and so um it's it's not about you know two people just separating it's about two people trying to destroy one another and if it's not two people trying to destroy one another it's one person trying to destroy the other but uh in any event it turns into it turns into just a, a debacle and and just a, it's gross really and so um and then the custody fight is is uh, a distraction really because a lot of times when there is um, a lot of money at stake, the attorneys try to stretch it out, right, for years and years. Mine lasted five years. 
And during that time, I think there were like at one point 30 different attorneys involved. And uh, I mean, that's a joke. I mean, it, that's insane. It's, it's actually criminal. And, um, but you see what happens is that uh, then there's a custody fight. And so you spend like three years trying to prove that you're a wonderful mother and everything. And then, uh, then there are shrinks that can, you know, come to your house and say, well, you know, I noticed that the children's sock drawer was kind of a mess. So maybe she's not a, uh, you know, a great housekeeper or a great mother or, you know, just stupid things like that. And so, um, so the children are really used as pawns in a game of uh, one parent you know, expressing their rage, like abandonment rage, you know? And so they, it becomes, it's just like this war between two people. But the, the tragedy of it is that the children are just pawns. And so, um, and, it, and it doesn't end after, while well, the custody is a trial is going on, what happens is that it's a distraction because what really is going on is that the money's being being moved around and the money's going offshore, the money, you know, all of a sudden, you know, there are different accounts and things are being moved and closed and opened in other names and in other countries and, and things like that. And so um, it, it is, it's just, it's a joke. I mean, it's a sad, sick joke, but nonetheless, it is, it is what happens in every courtroom, in every part of the country. Um, I do believe that, and I've been told that by people that, um, that are in positions of government to know that. But anyway, um, or, you know, ridiculous things like how many times has, have the dogs been walked? And in fact, this is really funny because at one point they said, oh my gosh, you know, those, the dogs weren't even in that house during that particular week. And um, they said, well, he must have just been going outside gathering all the, the dog poop from other dogs and bringing it inside and putting it on the living room rug. <laughs> and I thought, I mean, it's ludicrous. You know, it, it's, it's funny, but it's tragic that it's so funny, really. But the system can be manipulated. And that's the tragedy. Because it isn't really the people that are doing it. They're only doing what they can get away with. And attorneys, they're only doing what they can get away with. It's the system. The entire system is broken. And um, um, even in terms of custody and visitation, you know, um, children manipulate the system too. They learn. And so I remember hearing my one son said, if you don't buy me this, I'm going to tell the judge that um, I had to sell drugs. And I said, why would you do something like that? And he said, because then I could prove that you're not a good parent and, um, and you'd, lose, you'd lose time with the other children. And I thought, that's really horrible. But you see, that is part of the way uh, the system has been designed to work that way. And so it's, uh, it needs to be kind of rotted out from the inside out, really. Um, and I actually, um, I saw this going on in not just my courtroom, but in all, all sorts of courtrooms throughout the building, whether it was even a civil case or family law or whatever, or criminal, um, people were just being destroyed just because of lawsuits and children particularly were being destroyed because they were just being used as pawns. And so I wanted to scream. I was so, uh, I was so, insulted. My soul was so insulted. And I imagine if you uh, had ever been in a position like that, I mean, with over 50% of all marriages ending in divorce and, and custody litigation being uh, such a uh, profitable uh, endeavor, you know, people are actually, um, they're encouraged, you know, to, um, to start custody battles. And all that does is it just uh, it creates more work for everyone, yes, and um, and just destroys our, our children, and uh, our children become wounded uh, forever as a result of that. 
But um, I was, I actually went to the government and I just said, I, I can't believe this is going on. And it's, uh, you know, not just my case, but you know, all around. And they said, oh, it is, it's the way things have been uh, since time immemorial. And, uh, and it, it, it does need to be changed, but um, who's, who's gonna do it? And so um, I thought we need to raise awareness and so they said, well, you know, talk about it, you know, uh, because you were on the inside and you do um, have a background in it. So, so talk about it and raise awareness. And, uh, and so I did, uh, and they said, and tell people. So I did, I wrote a letter. Well, that whoever um, has been, uh, whoever might have noticed, I've had a little bit of bad publicity, maybe <laughs> just a little teeny tiny bit, actually, uh, it was like, um, like an avalanche, but um, but it's because um, I, I did, I wrote a letter and I said, look, what's going on with our legal system and how, how can we uh, mitigate the, the devastation and the destruction to families? And, um, and then I was, I was um, my ex got a gag, he gagged me so I couldn't talk about it anymore. And then he sued me uh, for defamation and switch letters. So I never was sued for the letter that I wrote because there was nothing wrong with the letter I wrote. It was the absolute truth. And in order to have a claim for defamation, it has to be false. So, um, but they actually switched the letters and evidence. So I was sued for um, a letter I didn't write. And then I had this, and then I had this $10 million judgment, which was the largest personal, ju uh, personal defamation judgment in the history of the country. And, um, and so it, it, it increases every year um, statu with statutory interest of 10%. Um, but, you know, my ex-husband has died. God took, kind of, God took care of that one uh, because he got so many judgments against me that were just bogus. But, um, and that's not to say that some, that, uh, you know, that's why he's dead, but I'm just saying that he, couldn't uh, collect on that, although um, before he died, he did collect on uh, on a lot of it. Um, and you know, it, it increased, so probably by now it would be, I don't know, 50 million. And um, actually, I remember one of my attorneys said, oh my gosh, this is the, the most ridiculous verdict I've ever heard. And in fact, by the time you're 80 years old, you'll owe the man you married for, um, you'll owe him half a billion dollars and, and you did nothing wrong. So, um, so anyway, that was how that went. So, um, let's see, then after my, then after my father died, I had uh, a condo on the beach in Clearwater Beach that my father bought me. And, um, and so then, uh, my ex-husband went after my inheritance. And so he got my sister and my son to join in together with him. Uh, and so then they started raping and pillaging my inheritance. And so, um, so um, that was kind of interesting and changed the locks. I was on vacation and I came back and the locks were all changed and uh, my accounts were empty. And so basically I, I became homeless like that. I went from being very rich to being very like poor, 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 um, not even $20 in my account. So, um, so you see, Sometimes when we think of our sole purpose, um, I realized that I wasn't a victim to all this. I mean, I guess at some point I could, I felt like a victim, but really I had to see what was going on in order for me to speak about it. And in order for me to say, hey, <laughs> you know, this is really bad news. This, this has got to stop. How can we all, how can we do something about it? We must do something about it. Um, because literally, it's not the pandemic that's killing the people. It's truly, it is uh, the interpersonal relationships we have and the family issues and uh, the interpersonal issues that are just killing uh, our society. Um, our people of all ages, they're wounding our children, our children, you know, or um, see that their parents are mortal enemies of one another, they see uh, the corruption, they see uh, the craziness, they see so many things. Uh, and so it just, you know, destroys our children. Um, and
and then you know people that you know in court when one person wins and has a big win that means the loser has a big loss yeah and so um and and so so many people um end up having addictions you know whether it's um to alcohol or drugs or sex or um overeating or whatever whatever the addiction is you know um and then there's you know uh the reputation you know people are there's so much gossip and oh he cheated she cheated whatever it's really bad pr and it's just um it just destroys um our people and so so again um not to get distracted by the details but really the point is is Think about what your sole purpose is because sometimes when you feel so beaten down because of things that have been uh, injustices to you, well, maybe maybe it had to happen that way so that you could kind of, you know, it's like one more drop in that cup and it's gonna spill over. Well, maybe you're getting to that point where you have to speak up about something because if you don't speak up about something that has affected you and has impacted your life, then who will? So we, it's it's like a miracle that we um, go through so much. And sometimes those things that we go through are just amazing blessings because we're to open our mouth. You know, we have a mouth and, and we have a voice. And even though I was gagged and I couldn't talk for a long time, um, you know, um, whatever, maybe just, the timing wasn't right at that point but anyway it's time to tell the truth now and and so um so anyway i think that uh you know i'll get into a little bit more of this uh later on this week but sometimes we just you know have to do something about things that affect us you know and it only takes one person to sue us and that can change our life um you know overnight uh, in a negative way and so um, so anyway I thank you for being here and I I wish that all of your dreams come true and until we meet again I love you